So what are orthotics and prosthetics? Um, technically, it's a field. Um, orthotics is the evaluation, fabrication, and custom fitting of orthopedic braces known as orthoses. So bracing is really important for people who maybe have limb deficiencies or need protection of a limb. Um, prosthetics is a field where we are evaluating, fabricating, and custom fitting artificial limbs known as prosthetics or prostheses. Um, that one is a little bit more self-explanatory, one that people are a little bit more familiar with in the fact that we are replacing um, an entire limb for an individual. So who are we? We are healthcare providers. Um, we do a lot of schooling uh, to get our credentials. It takes us about eight years. So those uh, football players you see on the field wearing knee braces, we put them on. Um, the soldiers coming back from the wars, uh, we give them their ar new arms and legs. Um, we start out with a bachelor's degree. It can be in pretty much anything as long as we're meeting the requirements for our master's um, degree. A lot of people choose to do a biological science, kinesiology, or now engineering is becoming more popular um, with the developing technologies. And then we complete about a two-year master's program um, for masters of science. Some are a masters of science in prosthetics and orthotics specifically. Once we complete this master's degree, we have to go on to complete our residencies, uh, one year for orthotics, one year for prosthetics, and then we can sit for our exams. So I don't know if you noticed our credentials in the beginning. Um, Alex is a certified prosthetist, so he would be CP, and I'm a certified orthotist, so I'm CO. And then if you're both, you're a CPO. And these are just some of our, our faculty who you may have seen um, deliver some talks previously. So we have four locations in the city. Um, Alex works at the Orthopedic Institute. It's our primary prosthetic care. They only see prosthetic patients there. Additionally, we have a location at Zuckerberg San Francisco General, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. They see um, patients for prosthetics, orthotics, and they have inpatient services to the hospital there as well. Um, the Benioff Children's Hospital, where I currently reside, we see, as you can imagine, pediatric uh, orthotics primarily. We do have one or two prosthetic patients. Um, and then UCSF Medical Center here on this campus, we have adult orthotics and inpatient services. So now that you know who we are, let's talk a little bit about what we deal with on a daily basis, um, limb loss. So the Amputee Coalition is a national coalition who provides a lot of support materials for people who have experienced limb loss, and they define it as the removal of a limb by trauma, medical illness, or surgery. So there are two kind of buckets or ways that um, you can experience limb loss. It can be congenitally, like this little girl that you see in the picture here. Um, she experienced uh, her limb loss at, in utero um, due to amniotic band syndrome where the umbilical cord kind of cuts off the circulation to the limbs. Uh, or genetic defects. So for some reason they aren't able to develop their limbs properly. Um, this was a big one with Chernobyl back in the 80s where the radiation really um, created some, genet some genetic de deficiencies that caused some limb loss. You can also acquire amputation throughout your life. Um, vascular disease is one of the biggest things that causes limb loss, um, traumas, or cancer. So just to give you an idea of what it looks like across the country, we have about 2.1 million people living with limb loss in America today. This number is expected to rise to 3.6 million by 2050. Currently, we have about 185,000 amputations each year and 507 a day. Um, sorry, guys, you experience more limb loss than women, um, almost double. And if you are between the ages of 45 and 64, um, you are in your prime for experiencing potential limb loss. 85% of lower limb amputations are begin with an ulcer. So that goes back to the vascular piece of this whole thing. And if you look at causes of amputations um, right here, I don't know if we can see it, but vascular disease is the largest with 54%. Trauma was next with 45%, followed by cancer at 2%. 
and a majority of these are lower limb. What's important to note here is that in our little bubble in the San Francisco Bay Area is our demographics look a little different than this. Um, and it enables us to do um, a lot of the programs that we do, like Alex is going to talk about later. Our demographics are about 25% vascular disease, 25% trauma, 25% cancer, and 25% congenital. So that means a lot of our patients want to might be younger and, and might be more active. Um, and how do they return to that activity after losing a limb? So some of our local programs in the community. We do things like this, mini med talks, to help teach people about what it is that we do. We're a fairly small field, uh, so we really want as many people to understand what we do as possible. Uh, we participate in the Bay Area Science Festival. It's a really fun thing we do each year. Um, we talk to a lot of kids and a lot of parents, and it's amazing how many people connect with it but didn't really realize it existed. Uh, we also go to a lot of local school science fairs, elementary school. Um, it's really important to us that we expose kids um, to this early on so that when they see someone that may look a little different, it's, it's not unfamiliar and therefore not scary. Um, we most recently went to the STEM Women in Science um, Fair at Berkeley. That was a lot of fun. We had a lot of middle school girls who came and learned about um, what it is that we do. We broke it up into sections. We taught them how we take the impression, how we make the prosthes prosthetic, and how um, people train with their new prosthetic. So they really enjoyed that. Two things we're going to focus on tonight and talk to you a little bit more about is our functional limb service out of San Francisco General Hospital. And Alex is going to speak to you a little bit more about the amputee comprehensive training program um, that he has a large hand in. So our functional limb service, like I mentioned, is at San Francisco General Hospital. And it is a service uh, that really works with a lot of our uh, lower income population who is struggling with vascular disease. Um, it is a multidisciplinary approach to treat individuals with limb insufficiencies in order to improve the health of their limb and quality of life. So this idea was formulated in February of 2014 when they were noticing that a lot of these patients were being lost to follow up because they had to attend multiple appointments with multiple providers. And it, it made it very difficult for everyone to communicate and the patient to understand uh, the treatment. So they came up with this concept of having a clinic um, at San Francisco General where all of these providers came and the patient only had to come to one appointment and there was clear communication between everyone. Another goal of this program is that they really wanted to de develop resources for um, people to have to make informed decisions um, about potential amputation. So they applied for the HEART grant and received it in September of 2015 and had their first clinic um, in December of 2015 and they have been having a clinic once a week ever since. So where does it occur? San Francisco General Hospital. It actually takes place in the old hospital. Um, the Red Star is where we have um, FLS clinic each week, and the Blue Star is our building. So the point of this is not no one really has to go that far to, to all come together and really see a patient and be on the same page. Um, it's a great clinic. There are other clinics happening at the same time. So if we need to talk to other providers who happen to be in the other clinics, they're very easily accessible. So who's involved? There are actually lots and lots of people involved in this. Um, everyone from orthopedic surgeons to occupational therapists um, are primarily in the clinic setting. And then there's also a support group. So there's a group that gets together once a month um, that consists of patients. And we like to provide them with people like nutritionists or uh, social services and case managers to answer all of their questions. Uh, it really helps to have this support group and have each other. Um, and sometimes they even develop mentor-mentee sort of relationships. And it really helps them get through their experiences. So we talked a little bit about the goals. Um, primarily, prevention is a huge thing if uh, they're suffering from vascular disease. Making sure that they check for those ulcers so that they don't have to undergo an amputation is really important and something we try to stress. Um, education, if amputation is in fact the best option for them, what that looks like, what that means, what life after amputation will be. 
Um, we really wanted it to be focused on the patient, um, wanted them to be the center of the care, so really listen to their perspectives, answer their questions, make it easier for them to attend their appointments, and set their rehabilitative goals. What do they want to do, um, and how can we make that happen? We also, from a provider perspective, it really helps with communication, making sure we're all on the same page, um, utilizing each other should we need it. Um, so it really increases our efficiency as well. This has been proven in other countries. There are so many benefits of a team approach. And long-term studies um, have proven that this is effective in reducing amputations um, due to diabetes. So the UK did an 11-year study and saw that as we had a 60% drop in amputations in people with diabetes or vascular disease. Sweden did a 20-year study, and theirs was a 57% drop. And then Spain, um, they did a 15-year study, and it was a 62% drop. So these are pretty uh, great articles and very long-term studies and, and great data for us um, to base our approach off of. So this is an example of benefits. And this is not a patient who was a vascular patient. Um, this was a patient who suffered from alcoholism um, and ended up experiencing a traumatic amputation and ended up in the hospital. And he developed knee flexion contractures. And they discharged him from the hospital before our team, our prosthetic team, could see him. And so he was seen in FLS clinic. And when he has this degree of contracture, it makes it very difficult for him to walk with a prosthetic. So the orthopedic surgeon, the physical therapist, and the prosthetist all kind of got together and decided that the patient should undergo serial casting to help reduce the contractures. So the physical therapist actually did this um, piece of the work uh, over a course of several a month or two, and ended up being able to reduce the contractures um, quite significantly, I believe down to 10 degrees, and he was able to receive a prosthetic device and continue his follow-up in FLS clinic. So this is a video that kind of gives you an overview of exactly what uh, FLS is and just does a great job of giving you some visuals um, and a good understanding of how it impacts the patients. All across San Francisco, new ground is being broken to improve the care of amputees, led by the UCSF San Francisco General Hospital Orthopedic Trauma Institute. The clinicians at the OTI have established a functional limb service and are producing a patient tutorial video series. These videos will highlight the patient experience at every stage of the recovery process. They will help to educate and inform expectations for those who have suffered traumatic limb injury and limb loss. Patients will get to see how the process of getting a new prosthetic limb works and will be given an idea of what to expect as they begin working with their prosthetist. They will get a chance to see how their new limb is made and how it's customized specifically to them. They'll see patients, just like themselves, take strides toward reclaiming the mobility and independence of their pre-amputation lives. They'll get to hear patients, past and present, share their experiences and advice. Like, you know, it's something I, I was not expecting. I was not expecting, was not, was not thinking, you know, that this was going to happen. And, and when I actually stood up, I mean, it was all I, all I could do not, not, to, not to just, just start bawling. All the emotions of, of, of the reality of it, you know, of, of, actually, of actually standing up and realizing that life was about to change, you know, and that life is changing. It's not about to, it is changing. Um, that was a huge moment, you know, a huge moment there. The videos will also offer easily accessible tutorials on all aspects of living with a prosthetic limb. This series will feature glimpses on what to expect from the rehabilitation portion of treatment and will provide basic physical therapy tutorials. 
Finally, former patients will share their success stories, inspiring present and future patients as they travel on their own road to recovery. The physical therapists and the occupational therapists are some of the best people you're ever going to meet. So they're going to push you, they're going to ask you to do things that maybe you don't want to do or are not comfortable for you to do. But the better, the more you can work with them, the more they will work for you. A, a smile, a please and a thank you, um, an appreciation of what they do. It's amazing what, what it will. It makes their day better, it makes your day better. Once completed, this open source video series will be available to anyone, anywhere in the world. Okay, and with that, I'll turn it over to Alex, who's going to talk to you about the Amputee Comprehensive Training Program. All right, I'm going to talk about our ACT program. Um, much like the FLS service, this program also relies on the, uh, the multidisciplinary team of our department. Uh, but what it includes is the extension of our care outside of the clinic. Um, and what I mean by that is the traditional uh, model of delivering and providing a prosthesis comes as a you know, prescription from the physician. Uh, we go through the assembly fabrication a custom fitting of the prosthesis and then physical therapy will work on gait training and teaching them how to walk. But then oftentimes that patient is left on their own at home to figure out how to integrate that device uh, into their, to their daily life, to their activities, how to regain um, some of the activities they enjoyed before amputation, the life before disease or, or illness or cancer. Um, so the ACT program is here to help that or address that. So it is the mission of the ACT program to assist those affected by limb loss in maximizing their physical and functional mobility. And maximizing really the, the key word um, has two components, the rehabilitation model and the outreach arm, uh, both of which create the community and the tools to make a complete recovery following amputation. Uh, there's a lot, obviously, of text on this slide. It's come just directly from our mission statement, but the key words really being the comprehensive team that it takes to provide these services, much like the FLS, um, and then goal-oriented treatment, meaning specific goals to this patient um, that can drive our care. Uh, and I'm talking like maybe walking on the beach, playing with your children, uh, making dinner, things that we can help that patient achieve, put the, the resources in place um, beyond just building a good prosthesis. Um, and then the community outreach side of this is, is really bringing in, drawing in the resources of the university, uh, our community partners to assist and, and create training and awareness opportunities, encouraging an active lifestyle. Um, and we'll talk more about that. So there's you know, many uh, resources at our disposal, obviously being part of a big university. Um, and so this is, is one of our, um, one of those services, the Human Performance Center, or uh, one of those resources down at the Mission Bay, uh, Center, Mission Bay campus. Uh, you can see this is a young gentleman who was a football player, track athlete in, in high school, um, lost his limb above the knee to cancer. Um, and, you know, his goals were to get back to running. So. Um, this is that next level of care uh, that the ACT program can, can offer. Um, so he now needs access to specific uh, prosthetics, running specific prosthetics, um, training how to use it. And then in the Human Performance Center, we can provide biomechanical um, metabolic data to assist him in, in performance goals. Uh, we also do a lot of work at our fitness centers uh, across campus. Um, this is a young woman with upper extremity involvement. Um, she's also now in college and, um, you know, wants to be able to work out and, and join her friends at the gym. So this is a, a specific upper extremity prosthesis and she's at the gym, uh, you know, figuring out, we're all figuring it out together, how to adapt the device to her needs uh, and her equipment. Um, prosthetics is very custom to the patient, but also custom to the activity um, often especially when you're talking higher level performance-based goals. Um, so this is, you know, some images showing the growth of the program. Um, in 2012 was our, our first kind of meeting of the masses and um, it was focused around um, some patients that were wanted to try to run again. And you can see the growth. This was a, a basketball camp uh, last year. 
Um, you can see the growth, especially in kids. And, and what we've noticed is it, it's, it also, these events, these programs often serve as support groups uh, to these patients. Um, they can come meet others, uh, see what other types of devices people are using, families, especially children, uh, families with children with prosthetics um, can meet others. Um, so it's a very supportive environment. We also partner with the Challenge Athletes Foundation, which is a nonprofit down in San Diego uh, that helps provide prosthetic devices and equipment uh, to patients that don't have access either with insurance or without the, without the coverage, um, such as running legs. And you can see in these photos, these are several running events that we host uh, down in Mission Bay. Uh, we also uh, work on uh, swimming and rock climbing clinics with them. Um, and the goal of something like this, obviously, is to provide a supportive, comfortable environment to try either if it's a new activity or just maybe an activity they enjoyed before amputation, but maybe lost the trust and the confidence that they could do it again. Um, and so providing a comfortable environment to, to do that again is, is obviously very valuable. And now we've been lucky enough to, to partner with the Warriors on basketball clinics, um, which have been hugely successful, not just because the team's you know, doing so good right now, but um, I think people realize uh, to be in an um, environment with a lot of other people um, that are facing the same obstacles um, and trying things together, um, falling together, uh, having fun, um, and then basketball also, um, so you can see in this picture, well, you know, you might be dribbling, you're, you're, you're focused on the team and the others and the, and the basketball and not just on your prosthesis. So you really see this progression in their recovery, um, realizing that they don't have to focus on every step, um, but can shoot or dribble or pass. Um, and an event like this, uh, or really any of the events, you, you, what you often see in the, in the progression is someone coming for the first time, you know, talking to people, sitting on the sidelines, being you know, glad they're there but not ready to participate. Um, and they kind of get to watch and observe, see what's possible. And then the next year, you, know, you might see a gentleman like this right, saying, I want to get up, I want to shoot, I want to play. Um, and I'm willing to bet that you know, the following year, this, this gentleman would, would probably walk in without his wheelchair. And you'll see that progression through the years. Um, so some other events um, are at San Francisco CrossFit, um, which is another um, great resource for us in that it, uh, the adaptive exercise is another way to think about functional movements that you have to do every day, picking up items, groceries um, off the floor, putting them up, lifting things above your head, things that we don't maybe think about, but once you've lost part of your, your body um, and you're adapting to using a device to replace that, um, those, those tasks become you know, more uh, thought consuming. And so um, this is to um, make those motions easier and more efficient. These are some other images. So San Francisco CrossFit. We also do some um, events with the Bay Area Outreach and Recreation Program, BORP in Berkeley, which is more focused towards wheelchair users, um, sled hockey and, and basketball, wheelchair basketball. Um, and then Achilles International is a, is a running group for people with disability, heavily involved with SF or uh, New York City Marathon. But this year, um, we are uh, pushing for having adaptive um, starts in the SF Marathon, so, um, which is also a fun opportunity for our patients. Um, so in, in closing to the ACT program, I encourage you, you know, to be involved, volunteer. Um, if you want more information, uh, feel free to email me or contact us our, off our website. Um, hopefully we'll see you at the next event. So now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and start thinking about or talking about the millions of people that don't have access to prosthetic care um, across the world. And I'm going to start with some background, some definitions um, and statistics, um, starting with the DALI, the Disability Adjusted Life Year, which you may have heard about. Um, it's, a, a it's a metric used to standardize the burden or the effect a disease or illness might have on a person uh, or a, a population, a country. Um, it's, it's expressed as, as uh, the accumulation of the number of years lost to living with disability plus the years uh, lost with 
uh, with early death. Um, so really it's a, a metric that combines morbidity and mortality, um, and we'll talk more about it throughout this. Um, so if we look at this report from the WHO uh, burden of disease in 2004, um, these are the leading causes of burden of diseases um, as ex expressed as DALIs, and you can see um, just the general trend, um, and these are projecting out to 2030, um, you see the decline in the communicable diseases, the infections, the diarrheas, the HIV AIDS, these are things that get a lot of um, attention in global health, um, but unfortunately, you see an increase, an expected increase in road traffic accidents and diabetes. Um, and we know that that is, or those are leading causes of amputation. So this need is only increasing. Um, to look directly at diabetes, this is a, a plot of the prevalence of diabetes in the world by region. The, the dotted line is, is just the, the, the global average. And you can see on the, on the gray line um, is, is Africa, and then on the purple is the uh, Middle Eastern countries. You can see those are moving at, at a greater trajectory, higher slope. And uh, the metric is that the, the prevalence of diabetes is expected to double um, from its 171 million cases that were re recorded in 2000. And we know that this is due to lack of physical activity, um, increased access to high energy, dense foods in these countries, in these regions, um, increase in obesity, and then obviously the also increase in expected life years. So um, diabetic foot ulcers are quickly becoming leading sources of morbidity and mortality, especially in these low and middle income countries. And WHO recognizes diabetes as an important cause of premature death and disability. So if we look at road traffic injuries, um, this is a, a map of the world that expresses the mortality rates due to road traffic injury, but that can be correlated with, with trauma, injury, amputation. Um, you can see the high rates in African countries, um, Asian countries, um, and in fact, you know, road traffic injuries are one of the leading causes of death and lifelong disability. And truly the leading cause of death in young men ages 15 to 29 which are in these countries, or, or in any country, often men that are um, entering the workforce, um, the productivity years of their life. Um, so um, unfortunately, 90% of DALIs due to road traffic injuries occur in low and middle income countries. Um, so that kind of defines the discrepancy. And this is partly due to economic growth in these countries, um, which is introducing uh, more vehicles to the road, including motorcycles. Um, but also combined with lack of road infrastructure and uh, safety road laws. So in those reports, the WHO states that 25 million people are living without access to basic prosthetic and orthotic services. And as you would expect, that you would, this leads to a loss of functional mobility, independence, um, isolation, loss of employment, inability to care for oneself, um, which will you know, end up having an economic, social, and psychological effect on, on the person, uh, on the population, and on the country. So as so we start to, to recognize what are barriers to this care, how do we address this need, um, there's, in, in generic terms, there, there might be a solution that just doesn't exist. Maybe there is a solution that does exist, but it's not accessible to these people. Um, or maybe the technology exists and is accessible, but it's not being adopted for some reason. So um, in, in the prosthetic literature, uh, this uh, lit literature review from Akita et al. in 2014 addressed this in, the, in this way and suggesting that the appropriate prosthetic technology must be affordable, durable, functional, and cosmetic. Um, this, this article by Wiss et al., um, which was a survey of 192 individuals working in the field of lower limb prosthetics um, with 64 different countries represented, really expresses um, that need. I um, just want to highlight, obviously, the four um, or five main um, needs revolved around cost, part and material availability, uh, cosmetic appearance, um, practitioner training um, or skills, education, and then the durability of the devices. So 
Um, obviously, we feel that UCSF and our, and our department, um, in conjunction with other departments, are, is ideally suited to assist our international partners in, in addressing this in education, with training, research, implementation, building capacity to provide care in these countries, and ultimately, hopefully, to drive changes in policy and legislature that um, not only will um, in court encourage uh, providing the resources and the services to, to address this need, but also at a higher level, road traffic, safety, and laws, um, and funding into in public health and global health. So to, to, just to focus on one project um, to, that expresses these points is, is our partnership with the Muhambili Orthopedic Institute in Tanzania. This is heavily involved with IGOT, the Institute for Global Orthopedic and Traumatology at San Francisco General, um, where our orthopedic surgeons are heavily involved in surgical training um, to address the road traffic trauma. Um, so Muhambili, which is in Dar es Salaam, um, is a, a region heavily burdened by amputation, which is increasing due to diabetes and road traffic accidents, and very representative of, of all the data I just talked about. And so the initial study or project was just qualitative assessing the need with, with interviews um, of, of key figures in that pathway, um, observing the actual provision of a prosthesis and mapping it um, so we can identify uh, barriers or, or, or locations of improvement. Um, like I said, it's a, it was a survey and observation of several uh, healthcare providers at this institute. And, and as you would expect, um, the, the, care, the barriers that were identified heavily involved around cost and then communication among those providers, um, which is a recurring theme um, across those providers to gather these patients and um, provide proper, complete care. Also, we identified that the numbers of amputation were severely underrepresented. Um, it also uh, you know, stressed the importance of this multi multidisciplinary approach. And, and then proper surgical education in um, addressing the road traffic injury, um, providing a, if, if an amputation is involved, providing a residual limb that can be fit with the prosthesis um, and fit comfortably and provide a functional outcome. <clears throat> All this led to a, a kind of a grander, larger study called the Predictors of, of Health-Related Outcomes After Traumatic Lower Extremity Amputation in Sub-Saharan Africa. And the three key uh, specific aims from the study were to identify, the, you know, define the, uh, the quality of life and functional outcomes in above knee amputees before and after a prosthesis, um, and then estimate the effect um, or uh, the cost associated with this type of care and the impact it would have on several uh, of the metrics, such as the DALI, um, that can be used to define or, or represent the, the effect the, um, that, this, this, that the fitting of prosthesis would have on, on a person and then on a, and a population. And part of this study included um, a, a package of prosthetic components to, to address their cost. We worked with a lot of different partners to put together the prosthetic components um, that should be sustainable for their environment. This is, this is actually a knee unit. Um, May are from San Francisco, uh, a foot from Turkey, and then a few other components from Turkey and, and Germany um, to put together a package that met their, their cost needs. Part of it required the education of the local um, staff on, on fitting these type of components and these type of prosthetics. And then ultimately, this is the team there um, the study is ongoing right now. At this point, we have 47 patients enrolled. Um, the goal is 60, and then there will be one year of follow-up um, with our prosthesis, so, um, which is a, an impressive number in our field. And to capture that data, hopefully I can be here next year to, to talk about um, the outcomes from that, but it, it's, it's been fun. And now Corinne is going to talk about projects closer to home that have equally as big an impact. So 
So not all of us are as fortunate as Alex to travel to Tanzania and really get to work with the people there. Um, but during my uh, master's degree, I was struck with the idea of, well, what can we do here to help? How can we figure out a way to give, find information and give people information that they can utilize in these places across the world? Um, so one thing we can really do is work on that uh, last factor that Alex talked about, the durability. Um, we have the machinery here and the schools and the facilities to really test the mechanical properties of these components before we send them out. So one thing that I did was I looked at the foot durability um, via mechanical simulations um, of the International Committee of the Red Cross Foot, which is a common foot uh, that is distributed to low resource um, nations. A lot of these places also wear flip flops like this, so that makes the componentry particularly susceptible to the environment um, and causes them to break down quicker. So as Alex touched on as well, um, Lots of people are left in these uh, settings without access to prosthetic care. They the World Health Organization estimates that about 5% of these people actually have a prosthetic. So a big goal is to really keep the 5% maintained, make sure they have good long-lasting equipment so that the people there aren't as burdened um, by having to repair their prostheses and also trying to fit all of these new people with them as well. One thing that the um, International Society of Prosthetics and Orthotics has really been looking at is the durability of prosthetic feet. Um, they determined that it was, it pretty much determined the durability of the entire prosthetic. If something is wrong with the foot and the person cannot walk on it, then they're not able to be mobile. There are a lot of studies that looked at a lot of different types of feet, um, and the breakdown rate of these feet is between nine months and a year. Uh, without sufficient protection. So one thing we were able to do is simulate this environment, um, this hot, humid environment uh, that has a lot of sunshine. So we put some UV lights in an environmental chamber, turned the humidity up, and really exposed these feet, um, these polyurethane-based feet, to all of the elements. We also performed some cyclic testing. Ideally, this would have been done inside the environmental chamber to really simulate more of an accurate um, environment. These people are walking on these surfaces in this environment, um, so a lot, of, a lot of things are hitting these feet all at once. Some interesting things we found by doing this um, was that shoes actually protected the feet um, fairly well from UV light and radiation. And so you can see that the sample without shoes is a little bit more brown, and the shoe sample looks a little bit more purpley. Um, and so that was the purpley one is the original color of the feet. The uh, chemicals were, the polyurethane was breaking down um, in the no shoe sample due to the UV light and radiation. Um, which caused a, a lot more breakdown, visual breakdown, um, that we could see in the seam and where these feet were put together. So this testing, um, we got a lot of numbers from this as well, um, but this testing, the point is it can really help us determine the lifetime of a foot before we send componentry there. So while this isn't being directly there with them, um, it can sort of help preemptive preemptively solve some problems before we send uh, this stuff and distribute it globally. Um, so in conclusion, a multidisciplinary team approach is really, really important both here and abroad in making sure that we are successful in treating patients um, who need prosthetic care. Um, expanding the care beyond the clinic to um, in, in making it outside of the clinic in the community so that they can um, have resources, bond with each other, and really get back to those activities. Um, we want to engage the local community and get other people involved in caring for these patients with us. Um, we really think education, training, and research creates uh, sustainable programs that will last and really continue to help people. And lastly, local initiatives can actually have a global impact, which many people may not realize. These are our references. And at this time, we will entertain questions. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer that question. The questions um, regarding education in this field and why are there, um, is there only one school in Southern California 
when we have the resources uh, to do the proper training up here. And I, I agree with you. Um, I will let you know that there is a second school now at Loma Linda University, which is also down in Southern California, though. Um, That's private. Per, yeah, private, um, but also providing orthotic and prosthetic training. Um, I agree with you that I, I actually went to the CSUDH program um, and it is a good program, but as the need uh, in this population grows, that the training is going to also have to grow, and I think San Francisco would be a good site for it. Um, I know our department's talked about it, but I think <laughs> there's a lot to go into that. Um, I mean, Corinne could probably speak. I mean, the programs all across the country are definitely growing. Um, there's becoming more. Um, I don't see why San Francisco can't be in that, but I, out of our price range. Yeah. <laughs> There are actually 13 schools, last time I checked, across the country doing this, and um, they host about 20 students um, each, so that's not a huge volume. I, I think one thing we're also struggling with in our field is having enough residency sites and, and really getting our kids, after they come out of master's degree, um, finding them a place to go for their training before they sit for their exams. Um, so luckily we have one here, so that's a, it's a great step, but I agree with you. I think more schools could adopt this program would be very valuable. Yeah, our contribution is, I mean, at this point right now is we do take th four residents um, every year, so providing that part of the training program, but um, the actual master's coursework is in California, it's still done in Southern California, but um, the first part of the question uh, was about um, engaging Laguna Honda and getting um, getting the referrals, getting the team there, and using that as a um, representation of, 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 of these type of services. And um, I also agree with you in that. And I know it often to the referral side, and I'll speak to that. Uh, you know, Dr. Pa yeah, Dr. Pasquale, she can't be that person because she's got a lot of other things going on. No, I and guess. yeah, so we do do. Um, one is it's in-service training to the social workers and the case manager, which are which are great, and those are the ones that are eyes in in on the ground in the facility that can encourage their participation in this. And then we do try to have patients that have come through the Laguna Hada system um, return there to um, either teach. Um, we've had one gentleman go there and teach a like a mixed martial arts class. Um, and some other ones that are geared towards you know, the proper way to fall. Um, or um, I think we even had one that was like ballroom dancing. So these are a lot of patients that become advocates and turn around back to Laguna, um, which is, I find the most valuable um, because one, they're giving back to the community that they, they, they came through. Um, and then they can speak directly to patients going through this same um, process, um, which often carries more weight than me telling them you know, what's going to happen and what we're going to do. So, so the question was talking about um, at Laguna Honda, uh, and, you know, going through the, the standard rehab, going through physical therapy, learning how to walk, and getting the clearance essentially for discharge, because um, it's, it's expensive to, to be living in a facility or a hospital. Um, and so hitting those milestones to walk um, independently, and then you can go home. But that, like, as you, as you mentioned, leaves them still um, unknowing how to participate in, in other activities of life. Yeah, and I, I believe the way that we're addressing this, really the only way right now is to engage other people in the community that will have a piece in this to provide those extracurricular curricular services. Um, yeah. Um, we also have some of our team members go from San Francisco General over there once a week. So if they're able to see them while they're at Laguna Honda and deliver a prosthesis, they follow up with them at Ho General Hospital. And so we try to scoot them into the FLS um, clinic and try to get them involved in that if they want to. Um, so we do have a little bit of a hand in it and we do see some of those patients. So we try to vet them that way. Yeah, the questions about uh, volunteers and how you get involved with the, the program. Um, specifically for the, the ACT, the Amputee Comprehensive Training Program, we do have a lot of volunteers, physical therapists, people from the community at our events. Sometimes it's just simple registration, um, simple crowd control, making sure people know where they go. A lot of people do show up in wheelchairs, so we use assistance to get people from the parking lot to the basketball court. Um, 
uh, those with more comfort and experience might be on the court or on the field to um, often just walking next to someone that's using a device is, is, is a very confident and stabilizing force to that person. So we use volunteers as just guides or assistance on, on the courts. Um, so um, and the funny thing is we often have more volunteers than we do participants, um, but that's a good problem to have. Um, so um, I recommend you know reaching out to us for future events. The question is about continuing education, how we um, integrate into you know, medical curriculums um, and uh, you know educate the uh, medical field on our services. Um, and I would say we're lucky because uh, especially the surgeons and physicians that I got in SFGH are heavily uh, not, not interested but understand the benefit of our role in the team. So we're lucky to be involved in a place like that. Um, and I got as, as a perfect example. Um, they do include us in their what's called their, their courses, their SMART course and their trauma um, courses um, in education because it's part of the field of trauma um, and, and the outcomes. So they heavily involve us. I would say beyond that, um, we're always, it's not involved in standard medical curriculum um, as far as I know. Um, we do involve with physical therapy curriculum. Um, we do teach in that, um, but that's often just for a lecture or two. Um, some do come rotate through the clinics to get more exposure. Um, I think as to the statistics, as the number of amputations continues to increase, and this field's becoming more, um, I don't want to say mainstream, but you're seeing it in a lot more in movies and commercials and TV, and people are going to recognize that technology. Um, I think more people will, will start including it. Um, as, as we're getting more exposure, that, that speaks to like our, our initial outreach community events of educating the public. Um, so that's my long answer to that. <laughs> and for orthotics as well, we do in services at the, ho the hospitals that we are located at. So for me at the pediatrics hospital, we'll do in services about different devices that we have to nursing staff or new residents coming through. So we try to keep up on that as much as possible so that they can utilize us um, and know that we're there and what kind of services we can provide to people. So we do try to do that. We do try to interface with other um, residents or doctors. Yeah, the, the questions about um, our involvement with the Veterans Hospital, and um, even though UCSF um, is involved with our, us specifically in orthotics and prosthetics, we don't. They do have their own O and P facility there, um, at the one in San Francisco, but also the one in, in Palo Alto is, is is bigger. Most of the patients will go through there. Um, and to be honest, they refer more patients to us. Um, um, just some of the compl more complicated cases. Um, and um, so the San Francisco VA often refers to us. We see a lot of their patients. Um, nationally, a lot of uh, you know, the military and armed forces go through the Walter Reed and Center of Intrepid and other Reed in San Diego Naval Medical Hospital. So um, a lot of the patients, the VA patients go through those. We'll consult um, if needed, but 